Department. Would you please stand for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Nelson. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for this day. And as we uh, sense your love and your goodness in our lives, we recognize that, Lord, uh, we are in a day and age where there is a lot of turmoil. And that is literally beyond our ability. And so we covet your strength and your direction in these days. Thank you, O oh God, for this great city that we get to live in. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would continue to give us the kind of wisdom that we need to direct the future of this great city. Thank you for these women and men who give themselves to lead of the city as well. We pray your blessing on them and your direction as well. And throughout this council meeting here this evening, we pray your will would be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council Members Huff? Here. Perkins? Here. Stewart? Here. DeLucy? Here. Steinmeier? Here. Hobart? Here. Mayor Weir? That uh, now moves us to the citizens' request. Uh, I believe we have one this evening. Uh, is that correct, City Clerk? Uh, Lord Dominic requests to speak to the Council regarding the funding of IPL officers at Hawthorne. Ms. Dominic. Resolution 20-759, uh, asking Hawthorne Associates and the POA AH communities to contribute more money to cover the cost of the IPD officers at the Hawthorne substation. As Mayor Weir said in her State of the City address on February 12, 2019, violent crime in Hawthorne apartments has decreased by 37% since the substation was opened. POA AH and the management company currently donates nearly 50% of the amount to cover these officers' compensation, and they donate uh, in kind the use of their building to house these officers. Um, in, in this world, when money's tight for everyone, uh, POAH is a nonprofit foundation um, organization, and Hawthorne um, has as many financial struggles as all of us do. Um, so I think that. Uh, I would ask that instead of asking them for more money to cover this, uh, given the amazing results that they've been able to produce out there, we've been able to produce, the officers have with our presence out there, I would ask that the council members in the city support saying thank you to those organizations for what they currently cover instead of at this point asking them to cover even more. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anyone else that would like to speak to the council this evening? If none, that'll move us to the consent agenda. Uh, Councilman Steinmeier. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Huff, I move to approve the report's recommendations of the city manager. I hear a second. Second. Thank you. Motion's been made on the floor and seconded. Uh, is there any council member who'd like to pull anything of these items? Mr. Mayor, I'd, I'd like, Mayor Pro Tem, I'd like to uh, pull number one and two for discussion. One and two. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Number three, six, resolution one, resolution five, and resolution six. That was three, six, what was the other two, I'm sorry. And then resolution one, okay. five, and six. And Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, 
also if we could pull number five please what was that pull number five please on which one on, on the, i'm uh, sorry on on the uh, consent agenda on the resolutions or the on the consent oh i'm sorry on the resolution sorry on the resolution yeah yeah that's pulled. So, um, had a motion second on the floor for the resolution and the recommendations of the city manager. Please call the roll, except for the ones that were mentioned. Councilman Versoff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Councilman Hobart. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, Items number one and two on the consent agenda tonight uh, deal with uh, software and it looks like some hardware upgrades. The total between the two uh, is somewhere in the neighborhood of $3.3 million. And uh, we had an audit and finance committee meeting last Friday. Uh, Councilman DeLucy, Councilman Perkins and I, and of course some members of the city manager staff. and. We're, we're in the position where we, we were concerned enough about the implementation of MUNIS to date that we're a little bit concerned about spending this kind of money on software without doing some further investigation and research uh, before just uh, approving that. So uh, we've discussed this with Mr. Walker, uh, city manager, and he, I guess, has arranged for a short presentation tonight uh, somebody from his staff that at least for the time being can provide a little bit more insight. Is that right, Mr. Walker? It is, um, and good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, pro tem, and members of the council. Um, what I would like to do tonight, um, given the significant investment that's being considered here tonight, um, the th you know close to $4 million, as our chief information officer, Jason Newkirk, is here, um, wanted to give you a little bit of a background um, about what this investment represents, um, why we believe this is important to bring to the council now. Typically, this would be part of a budget package. Um, you know, maybe next year the departments were asking us to consider funding this. However, given the, the sensitivity of this and, and really kind of the critical nature of it, I've asked uh, Mr. Newkirk to give a little bit of an overview and then both Mr. Newkirk and I can um, make ourselves available for questions. But he has the capacity um, and the background to give you a little bit more specific detail about what's being proposed here this evening with these two items. So with the council's indulgence, I'll yield to him and, and just do a quick summary. All right, thank you, uh, council. Yeah, just to, to give you a brief summary, I kind of want to give you a an overview of where we're at today and then talk specifically to the items that are on the agenda and how they're going to address some of the, the issues that we have today. So kind of where we're at is um, all with our data center, so that's the first item on the list, is that we, we currently have a, a large amount of our hardware that's sitting over in both of our primary and our backup data centers uh, that are nearing end of life. Um, and what that kind of means for the city is when, whenever we reach end of life on hardware, it means that you're at significant risk for a failure. And if a failure does occur on any of that equipment, obviously it can have an impact on critical city services such as public safety, utilities, uh, parks and rec, you know, things like that. And the situation you find yourself in is you can't go and buy a one-for-one -one replacement if something dies. Um, and so, you find yourself having to buy different equipment, bring it in, configure it, set it up. So you're in a situation where you, you've got a significant outage anytime any, anything dies. So um, that's kind of where we're at from a hardware standpoint. We've also just reached uh, capacity on a lot of things. So we're, we're running low on disk space. We're, we're maxing out on, on our processing capabilities with the, on all of our servers. So, so that's where we're at from a data center standpoint. Um, from a cybersecurity standpoint, uh, the city, it, it's kind of the same thing. We, we do find ourselves with a considerable amount of, of old hardware that we're dealing with that's, once again, nearing or at end of life. Um, but then also, the city, uh, one of the things that we have to do is we have to meet a lot of security compliance frameworks. So um, a good example of this is CGIS. So for, for public safety, for the police to store certain amount of 
types of criminal data, to connect to other agencies, they, they have to meet these specific security requirements. So not only do we have CGIS, but we also have PCI to take credit card payments. We have NERC and AWEA for water and power and light. Um, and all of those have very specific requirements to them. There's, there's, uh, there's specific tasks that have to be performed. There's very specific um, audits that need to occur. Um, and, and where we're at with our equipment today is it makes it very difficult for us to meet some of those requirements. So, um, so that's kind of where we're at today. So let me, what I've got here on the slide is just a brief summary of the data center and what it's gonna do. So our plan here is we didn't wanna go and, and just once again start doing one-off replacements, wait for something to die, wait for it to reach end of life, and then replace it. We, because we have so much that was reaching end of life within a short period of time, we did the research and did the due diligence to put together a comprehensive solution that will not only increase the capabilities of what we currently have, but it's gonna plan ahead for the next seven years. What we've got in this plan, we feel pretty confident that it will stretch the city forward for the next seven years, so we won't be coming back and asking for significant hardware purchases during that time. Um, and this, this is to replace hardware both at our primary data center and our backup data center. Um, and not only that, yeah, it, it's gonna um, also improve a lot of the manual tasks the technology services staff has to do today, um, backups being one of them. So we're gonna automate that so we're gonna be able to increase efficiency within our staff so that we can focus on the things that help make all of the other employees within the city more efficient. So that's the data center. Um, also, one of the things I wanted to point out that it's gonna greatly decrease the footprint. So you see here, it's gonna have a 60% footprint reduction. It's gonna ha increase uh, computational efficiency by 70%, 40% increase on file storage, and 40% increase on video storage. So, so we're really adding to our capacity here and getting us to where we need to be instead of just struggling to get by. Uh, the cybersecurity enhancement. So we planned this, once again, as a comprehensive cybersecurity solution that will enhance the overall posture uh, of cybersecurity within the city so that we can meet those compliance frameworks. So um, this has a few different components to it. So it's, hard, it's some hardware, um, to, and it's also some software, but it's also um, got in here some managed uh, services for uh, security analytics, instant response, so if we do have an incident, uh, we've, got, we've got people ready that can uh, detect, contain, mitigate, and then recover from any incident that we have. Um, <clears throat> also, it will we'll have access to cybersecurity support services so that we can meet those um, framework requirements that I spoke of earlier. Um, and so by implementing all of this, we're, we're gonna be able to move uh, forward towards meeting those those regulatory requirements. We're also gonna be able to mitigate any known vulnerabilities that we have uh, today. And then kind of the third item, and, and this, this has two pieces to it, is the network enhancements. So uh, the first piece is core network equipment that's part of the data center project. So this is the network equipment that connects all of the pieces within the data center to each other. And the, the second piece is the network equipment that will go out to all of the different city facilities. So same story as I told you on all the other ones. We're, we're currently, we've got very old network equipment and, and a good chunk of the city building. So what this is gonna do is replace that, um, provide us with a, a faster, more reliable network, but also it's gonna put the same thing in all of the buildings so that staff can better manage that instead of having you know five or 10 different types of switches that we're managing, we're gonna have one. We're gonna have one place to look. We're gonna have greater resiliency that way, uh, greater reliability. So that, that's kind of the summary of those three items. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any specific questions about them. Um, I'd also, you know, I'm, I'm available in the future to um, discuss this at a, a study session or anything like that, so. I. I've got some follow-up questions, yeah. um, and I don't know if you're the right person to answer to Mr. Walker. Uh, how much of 
of the agenda items, how, what, what, what percentage would you give are hardware and how much of this project is software? Uh, the vast majority of it's hardware, I would say. Um, some of it is, so when, when I say software though, um, we're not talking about end user software, we're talking about ser software that runs. Um, yeah, at a server level. Ser yeah, server in hardware essentially, yeah. Yeah. So oh, the, the vast, vast majority of it's hardware though. Uh, is it software on both sides of the firewall? It's, it is, it is. It's, the majority of the software is, is mostly virtualization software as well as, as well as some of the security software too. Um, who, who is a, in charge of this project and how long, if we approve this, how long does it take to? Yeah, so we're, uh, hopefully, you know, we plan on starting almost immediately. Um, I would expect for us to be done with this at the, at the end of uh, first quarter of 2021, uh, uh, maybe end of second quarter, somewhere right around there. So it's, um, if we start now, it's a uh, nine nine months. Yeah, it, it's nine. Yeah, nine months, maybe a little bit longer. Is that an industry standard time period in yeah, your that, opinion? Yeah, that's a pretty. It has a pretty aggressive time uh, table, but I feel confident that we can meet it. Okay. Um, it, are you in charge of? Is are the companies were were that have put these bids forward? Uh, who who's doing the actual installation of the hardware and implementing the software? Yeah, so the, um, all of this includes professional services to do the implementation, but they're gonna be working with city staff uh, to do that implementation. So it's, it's a joint effort. Have you been involved in projects like this before? Uh, yes. Okay, do you feel confident that we have the staff to do this project? Yeah, it, and that's why we've got the professional services in there. It's the, the majority of the heavy lifting is gonna be done by um, the contractors, um, but once again, you, you can never just send the contractor away and say, oh, go do your job. You know, they always need to work with city staff. Okay. Yep. That's all I have for you, Mr. Newkirk. I got a couple more for Mr. Walker. Okay. So. If I, if Jason. <clears throat> so are you in charge or is finance in charge? <clears throat> of the project, um, the implementation of the project? Correct. I'm in charge of the implementation. Of the okay. And do these prices include a project manager from Converge One to come in to install and to actually teach our staff how to use it? Yeah, so, so part of that installation process, be, you know, I, I mentioned that we have, uh, we have professional services, but then we also have the staff working with it. So part of that is, is a learning process. So as things get migrated over, as those networks get set up and the servers and such, there is an education part, process that's part of that, yes. Is this gonna be connected with the MUNIS system? So the MUNIS system is a hosted, externally hosted system. Um, so MUNIS is not hosted by this, but um, MUNIS does flow through our network. So in, in that sense it does, but, but we don't host it, no. Two years ago, this council approved $5 million to implement Munis, and it's not fully implemented yet. And that is giving me a lot of problem. And that is causing me concern, because you're asking me to approve, not you, but the city's asking me to approve over $4 million on yet something else. Sure. Why should I believe that this is gonna be done in nine months? I'm still waiting for Munis, and it's been over two years. There's a bit of a difference between a software installation, uh, just, just from my experience having worked on, on both, between a software installation and a hardware installation. So software installations are all, always very custom to the, the place that they're going. Um, every so time. have you met these Converge people? Yes. yes. And they know our system? Yes, yeah, we have, we have been working very closely with them for, for months on end. They have um, very closely studied uh, what we've got, how we use it. They pulled numerous statistics. Um, I feel confident that what they've proposed here, they, they have a very complete understanding of what needs to be done. Um, also, we've, we've been working with the same account manager throughout this entire process. She knows what, we're, what we've got very, very well. Is there a reason for us to approve it tonight versus having a study session on it 
and having it come back in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so one of the things that, that kind of got sprung on us here um, at the last minute, so a lot of this uh, hardware is through Dell. Uh, they informed us uh, just a, couple of week, a few weeks ago that they were planning on a price increase soon. Um, and it looks like that's going to happen in August. So if we don't issue a purchase order by the end of July, we're looking at roughly $154,000 <coughs> increase in the data center costs. But we didn't bid this contract out. Uh, so no, this was uh, this is off of a. Uh, a purchase this was after order. a purchase order from the state. So we don't know. Some other company might be cheaper. Um, so, so a lot of these costs are passed through from the vendor, so, so Dell, um, for that. So it, then it comes to the professional services. So uh, Converge One is a big company, and they, they, they do this very well. Okay. Um, yeah, there, there, there is a very good reason to go with them. And, and, and specifically, I, I will say that they, they work with a lot of local governments. And one of the, the benefits of us working with them, you know, we're, we're trying to project this out seven years. It's difficult to project seven years in the future for technology, right? So, but they work with a lot of local governments. And so they, they've brought to the table a lot of the knowledge that they've seen and the trends that they've seen to help us project those needs forward. I pulled number three, and that is also part of the data center and network modernization project. Yes. This is to Riverside Technologies, that's right. and that's for 971, almost 972 thousand dollars. So that the, all total network modernization and data is five million dollars tonight. Yes. And is everything you just said about one and two applicable to number three, or do you have other things that you can add on number three? Um, no, I mean not beyond what I what I said earlier. Okay, so. thank you. Mr. Perkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. So why was the spring up all of a sudden? Is work that good or not good for I, them? Sorry, I mean, what, what? that? Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay. So okay. why was the spring up? Why did they do that last minute? Um, why, why did Dell bring that up? Yeah. You know, it's kind of the last minute. Honestly, I, I don't know. I think um, the, the feel I got just when talking with the Dell representatives is that <coughs> they they don't get a lot of advance warning when prices are going to go up. Um, a lot of what's behind it, at least from what they said, is directly related to kind of the, the current situation that we're in. Um, production on technology equipment has slowed down, and therefore okay. prices to create them are, are going up. And so that's why they were moving in that direction. And so really, they, they kind of gave us a heads up to, to warn us that it was coming uh, before it was Leo. So what type of safeguards do we have so we're not two years down the road dealing with all of this technology that's not up and running or and fully implemented like we should have? Are you asking? I'm sorry, are you just asking? In, in general, in the, general, what, what safeguards do we as a city if we vote to approve this amount of money and we're nine months later right. still kind of twiddling our thumbs and things aren't fully implemented? Uh, Munis is not fully in implemented yet, and I've heard every excuse under the book, almost, mm -hmm. why that's not. So I want to know what the safeguards would be to where we won't have those yeah. uh, those things. Yeah, I, I feel like the, the professional services that we built in here and the time that we spent up front working with our vendor really is that safeguard. So, right. so like I said, we, we've spent six months working with these folks um, trying to nail down exactly what we needed. Um, you know, we didn't want to overpurchase, but we also didn't want to underpurchase and then have to come back to council later on. So I think that time spent ahead of time was, is really is that safeguard. Well, if, if I might add just one more uh, to Councilwoman DeLucy, who's the chairwoman of the uh, Audit Finance Committee, that perhaps we have a, another update like we do with our, our monthly financials of where we're at with the city. I don't know if monthly, but every two months. Like we are with Munis? Yeah, you add that in there, I mean. Okay, I'm being told, oh, we're moving it up a month. Okay. I, I'm just frustrated, and I'm sorry, but $5 million here, $5 million there. Well, I just want to make sure that we at least have those safeguards and, and on track. I, right. For sure. <clears throat> Does that sound good with you, Councilwoman? I don't have anything else for Mr. Newkirk, but I want to ask Mr. Walker. Um, it, I understand it may cost us some money, 
if we ask to put this off. Uh, that makes me sick to my stomach. It seems to be out of everybody's control. What is in our control, though, is to make smart spending decisions, and this is a lot of money for this city at this time. Also, don't discount that we need it. But let me ask you this. If we did decide to postpone this for a couple weeks, whether we blow our discount or not, can you have somebody here from Converge One and from Riverside Technologies to sort of provide us, no offense to you, Mr. Newkirk at all, to provide us some more in-depth analysis of what exactly is happening and when and that kind of thing? I, I absolutely can. Um, I will say in doing my job to the best of the ability for the council, I think it's my responsibility to give you some feedback about you know the different options you've got tonight. So we can certainly postpone this. We could have somebody in. Um, the risk that you run is really the risk I run every year at budget when this comes up, and that is we are talking about a lot of different things where, with, with cybersecurity and with this data modernization. You're talking about the utility account information for 57,000 customers whose personal information we're trying to protect. You're talking about a highly automated process at your water treatment plant that is subject to cyber attack. Same at your wastewater treatment plant. Same with your electrical grid. Oh, same with your municipal court system, all the records in there. So, so that is the risk you run, and, and, and I don't mean to sound alarmist or hyperbolic about it. I just, this was not the way that, you know, we ever want to do business, where we bring it to you and say we have to debt finance this because this is the cost. But the, the systems are, um, we're getting enough feedback. The, the risk assessment that the council funded a, um, a year ago is highlighting the deficiencies that we have in our system. And, and that's why we're bringing this to you with a debt financing package of paying for it over the next few years um, because of that. Now, is two weeks going to make a huge difference? I hope not. Um, but again, in doing my job to the best of the ability, this has happened to real cities out there, you know, Greenville, South Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, Baltimore. Um, all those cities were taken down by ransomware attacks and have had to pay a handsome price since then to unlock their systems. And even then, all the data hasn't fully been recovered. So um, again, I really caution sounding hyperbolic or hysterical. I don't know what two weeks time will bring. Um, we can hope for the best, but um, to answer your question directly, council member, we would absolutely work with a vendor and I think a vendor would have a strong incentive to get in here and answer those questions for the council. Is there a guarantee, Is there a guarantee that in nine or 10 months, this will be operational? Do they guarantee their product in that period of time? Yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if there's a clause in there with that. Mr. City Manager, if this council recessed this meeting mm -hmm. and brought it up next week at our study session, which I hope we don't cancel again, right. perhaps we can have these people come and talk to us and actually make a motion next week. Is that, is that allowed under our rules? I believe so, um, City Clerk. Let me look into it and I'll get back to you by the end of the meeting. I don't okay. think you can have an action item at a study session. Unless we recess this meeting. What I want to do is have a motion to recess this meeting, not conclude the meeting at the end of tonight, but recess it to have this as an action item on in before our study session the next Monday. So you'd like to have an adjourned meeting next Correct. Monday? Correct. You can have an adjourned meeting next Monday. Okay. I actually had a question for Mr. Newkirk. Um, I was told earlier that you're going to be moving one of the data centers. I think it was the primary one. Can you tell the advise the reason for that and why that would be necessary? The move. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so one of the things, one of the good things to do whenever you have a primary and a master data center is to put physical distance between them. Um, and and one of the things that's part of this is if we. You know, because we're greatly reducing the, the overall footprint of our data centers, we're going to be able to relocate uh, that data center to a different city facility um, that will be further away, which will essentially reduce the overall risk um, of, a, of something happening to both data centers. Yep. Okay. Is that what you are? Sorry. I, that's all the questions I have. I would, I would make a motion uh, oh, I'm sorry. I got, I got one other thing I'd like to make up. Uh, on the training, how many people is going to be involved in this training, and how long is this training? 
so, so like I said, it's, it's hands-on. Um, it's hands-on training. So as far as the time goes, it's going to be the implementation of the project. Uh, but we plan on having all of our network staff um, involved in it in, in various capacities. And how many employees is that? Um, so that's four. Four employees? Yes. Number two, um, on this, so when's, what's the time span of this thing? Are, are we looking at the expire in December? Or, I mean, I'm kind of lost on this part. I'm not a real fan of public purchase agreements. Mm -hmm because I, I've been there and done that, and I just, uh, you know, I kind of, if I didn't know anything about what I was supposed to be doing, I'd go to that book, because then we're experts in that. But I also paid the price for that expertise. Or on RFP, at least you're getting some competition here, because that book, you just sign, it's a price agreement, this is what I want, this is the price. So I'm just wondering, is there time to Send this out for an RFP, or are we in a critical uh, problem here? I mean, I don't want to jeopardize 57,000 customers and everything else goes on in the city, but if we're protected today, I don't see why we're pressing it that we can't send out an RFP. Like I said, I'm not a real fan of public purchase agreements, and I've done plenty of them over 35 years. Yeah, so just from a timing standpoint, so, so you, I'm guessing you're asking, you know, when some of this hardware is going into life. So, so we have some hardware that has reached end of life already that's in production service right now. Um, and we, we've got a lot of pieces of equipment. So we, we have things that are, are going to be continually going end of life. So this is a continuation just to keep things up to par. Yeah, so, so what this is, and, and that's what, actually what, that is what I'm trying to avoid here. So um, I, I don't want us to go as a city and just start one off replacing things because that will be expensive. Um, and it's going to, it won't be future thinking. So, so that's why we've, we've analyzed everything that we have and come up with this plan so that we are prepared for the future and we've, we've reduced the amount of hardware to purchase as much as, as possible to still meet the needs of the city. Do we have insurance? <clears throat> um, if we got hacked, are we covered? We do have cybersecurity insurance. Okay. But I, I would say so so that covers expenses right but there is there's risk to the outage and the downtime that you have it it takes a very long time to recover from a full comprehensive cyber attack we've seen that with with other cities across the nation um, and and yes so you do have insurance to, to help mitigate and, and recover from that but it's it, it's a long road mr. city manager I've, I, I've got a question in terms of um, the cybersecurity, um, the cost that uh, we have here, at one point, basically 1.6 million. In terms of, of um, municipalities, governments, they're, they're a target uh, for cyber hacks and, uh, and cyber attacks. Do you know what the national average is in terms of what um, percentage of a budget is spent to protect the data of their people? Hmm. Off the top of my head, I don't. Mr. Newkirk, do you industry um, figures? Percentage of a budget? I, I honestly, I don't uh, know. I will tell you that this, this 1.8 million, 1 1.9 almost for, for, well, the cybersecurity component, I guess, was closer to 1.6, but right. that that's about, in, in a this year we were around 300 million for round numbers. That's going to be six tenths of a percent. Um, so it's a relative to your overall city budget. It's a pretty small percent of your. And so again, I don't know where that benchmarks us, but looking at that in terms of what we spend. So, so I have a really great IT manager, Chris Johnson, who's listening in on this, and he just sent me a text and said that the industry standard is eight percent. Yeah. So we're spending less than one percent on cybersecurity, and the I had read it's somewhere between three and five percent. So eight percent sounds about right. So uh, is this a concern to anyone else? I mean that we're spending less than one percent on our on my data that the city holds, everyone in this room that are residents of our city. Uh, that seems like an awful um, it's an awful big risk.
Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I think the, the, the frame of the discussion is not so much the dollar amount as it is that we have the safeguards to have, have this thing implemented in a timely fashion that we have not seen with Munis. I think that's a big portion of the framing of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, Councilwoman, are you, would you like to make that motion to go into a recess session or adjourn session for next uh, Monday? I would, and that would be on items one, two, and three. Okay. They, they all deal with data center network modernization. I mean, and it's five million bucks. I'll, so, I'll second that. So all three of them, Councilman? Yes, sir. Okay. We have a motion on the floor and seconding. Motion to recess till the study session for number item number on consent agenda number one, two, and three. Is yes, sir. Correct? Yes, sir. For next week. For next week. Next Monday. Sounds good. Next and, Monday's and study and session. And just to specify, you want, you want a project plan and the assurances. Uh, I want to guarantee that my money is going to produce what I think I'm buying. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? I just want to say real quick, I've actually, working a full-time IT job for Jackson County, I've worked with Converge One before, and they are a great company. We've never had any problems with them. They have an excellent staff. Um, in fact, we're working a couple of projects with them right now, and um, so I have no problem with recessing it to have them come in, but I just want to put that on record. Any other discussion? Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilman Bershoff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. The motion passes. Councilman Hobart. Uh, I think that was the two that I, the two and we covered number three uh, that I had pulled. So I think Ms. Uh, Councilwoman DeLucy. Yes, uh, did you, um, would you make a motion to approve number one first? Please? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's been <laughs> what that's my first go around. What do I need to do, Miss I need a motion from you to, to approve number one. That's been I moved to the, the adjourned meeting huh? next week. So consent agenda items number one, two, and oh, three. Okay. We won't need yeah. motions okay. to approve. Yeah. Yeah. Right, fault, We've so. taken care of it. No worries. It's a newbie for me. Hey, we're in the same boat on that, all right? <laughs> yeah. So it's all good. And I think I'm up next. Yes, you are. Very good. Item number six. Item number six, Mr. Walker. This one is approval of the 2020-2021 excess workers' compensation insurance renewal. And basically, we're looking at workers' compensation. Um, this is an additional $334,000 is what we're looking at spending. And then a friend of mine who had nothing else to do with her life was reading the budget book today. And she said, gee, Karen, on page 16, it looks like you didn't allocate money for workers' compensation already as well as risk management. And so I read page 16 and I got very concerned. So, Mr. City Manager, can you please tell us, are we uh, fully funded on workers' comp and risk management? Is it allocated in the budget? And is this $344,000 in addition to that 1.4 million that's page 16, or is it contained within that 1.4 million? Yeah, so we are funded in the budget for workers' compensation and risk management. Workers' compensation, of course, covers injuries to your city employees and the line of duty uh, here at the City of Independence. Risk management would be you know, any kind of property damage, um, a wrecked vehicle, something of that nature. Um, just like all of our own personal auto insurance policies, our home insurance policies, the more you use those, the more the rates go up. Um, so we have our, our stand, in this case tonight, what you're dealing with, we have our regular workers comp and then we have an excess amount above and beyond. So if there was a massive claim, this would be excess coverage to, to help with that. Um, what I had put into the budget message, you got to remember that the budget was put together in a pre-COVID world and in a post-COVID world or a current COVID world. The budget that we were working on before, um, the way workers comp and risk management both work is just like your insurance. Again, that is based on historical uses and, and then the insurance company will give us an average amount over a certain period of time and say, this is your cost for the year based on your utilization over the last so many years. And some years are better than others. Some years we have high use and rates go up. Some years we don't and, and the average comes down. So we have a pool of money available in internal service fund for both workers comp and risk management. 
Um, what I was recommending in the budget initially was to reinvest in those to, because of some high claim years that we've had the past few years um, that we would would put excess money or extra money into that to boost those reserve funds for this. Um, with the downturn in the economy, the way the budget message was written, one of the immediate things we went in was uh, went in and stripped out all new funding requests. Okay, so whereas I was going to put money in or recommend to the council to reinvest in those funds, the recommendation became, hey, let's just pay to keep the doors open right now and the minimum things we need to do. So you are funded um, for your workers' comp right now. You have that money available, which you don't have. And what we really need to pay attention to next year moving forward is replenishing those funds while also working as an organization to drive down the costs, um, you know, safety training, workforce training, things like that that will help minimize the risk and, and manage our funds uh, more responsibly for workers' comp and risk management. So all this item does is reallocate 344,000. It doesn't spend the 1.4 million. No, this is going to purchase the excess coverage. So for those large claims um, that I believe um, are over uh, 1.5 million, this is to purchase that policy for those. And the general fund is paying for it? Uh, primarily, yes. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Is anyone else? I move approval of item six. Second. Motion's been made on the floor and seconded for item <clears throat> number six, which is approval of 2020-2021 excess workman's comp insurance renewal. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council members have? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. That brings us to the next one, uh, Councilman DeLucci, 20-754. Uh, this is that no city funds be expended on membership dues for the Independence Chamber of Commerce and that all expenditures for the Chamber of Commerce events be subject to review and approval. I was speaking to um, some members of the Chamber of Commerce, and I think it's a good idea that we go ahead and, and spend a little bit of time studying this issue before we make a general blanket rule like that. Um, I don't know if any, everybody has had a chance to speak with them. I know, Mr. Steinmeier, um, you were trying to. I don't know if you were able to accomplish that. Yeah, um, in fact, uh, uh, Mr. Walker and myself, we had a meeting uh, with Tom and and, um, and we invited Tom to come tonight, would like for him to come up and, and share with us. What we, what we talked about is just, it wasn't anything other than just um, an opportunity to really define our relationship with the chamber and the city, and I think it was a good positive meeting. I hope you felt so, Tom. Absolutely. Thank so. you, Councilman Steinmeier. Yep. Um, members of the Council, I'm Tom Lessing, President of the Independence Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we've had a good discussion. Um, we want to take some time to look at what this agreement consists of. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, the Chamber does a lot of things. We are a membership organization, but we do a, th a lot of things throughout the community. Things such as Santa Calaga on the Halloween parade, the citywide cleanup day, um, you know, first responders awards program that we've done in the past. We want to look at all those things and you know what brings value to the city in this agreement which is the membership agreement we want to make sure that, that all the deliverables in there provide value to this city so we want to take some time to work through that we also want to understand that in the next few months this council will be working on a new strategic plan and i think there's pieces in that plan that the chamber can have a role in help support because that strategic plan is not done by the city alone it's done by a lot of groups and organizations and people in this community and we want to get to that point where we know what that strategic plan, plan looks like so we can see what our piece of that might be. So we appreciate the opportunity to kind of work with the council on, on developing this agreement. It'll take a little bit of time, but I think we've got some time to work with right now. Is there any other questions? <clears throat> well, I, and I appreciate you coming tonight. I think, I, I think like any other relationship, sometimes we just get stale and it was just a matter of really just sitting down and talking through some um, some value points that that we felt were important to you and to us and so i i don't think we're in any hurry to make a decision on this um i think there's that give and take i know um our city manager wants to work more closely and and we're going to figure out the value of our relationship and i so i look forward to those conversations ahead and then we can come back and make a decision well, we appreciate the opportunity thank you is there anyone else
Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? We need a motion. Hmm? We haven't received a motion. We need a motion on oh. bill number 20 yeah, 754. I'm sorry, my fault. I was conferring with Mr. Simon oh. because he's really been the ringleader, and I wasn't sure if he realized it was on tonight that I pulled it. But Mr. Steinmeier thinks if he could postpone until maybe September 11th, that would be fine. Well, after our strategic meeting, that would be beneficial, and that's my motion that it be postponed until after our strategic planning meeting. Second. Whenever that is. What is that date? Uh, tentatively looking at August 21st. We'll get some, but August. So if we could do a, a September or October meeting, I think that would give us plenty of time to then liaison back with the chamber. Second. Second. There's been a motion on the floor to postpone this one until after the strategic meeting um, in September. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. That brings us to number five. Uh, oh, and it's 20. me again. <laughs> it's you again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, this is resolution number 20759, which is asking the city manager to renegotiate the memorandum of understanding with the city of Independence and Hawthorne Associates um, with Hawthorne Place Apartments. And I, I lived next to Hawthorne Place Apartments for 15, 20 years. And I was there when there were no police officers, and I was there when there was one police officer, and I was there when there was two police officers. And there is a world of difference between zero, one, and two. The um, Hawthorne Place Apartments used to be the third largest public housing unit in America. It's now the second. The group that owns it now has made um, significant progress in being a community partner. They have partnered with our police department they are paying over 50% of the benefits and the salaries. I know it's over nine or $10,000 every month that they pay for our protection. And these officers don't just work at Hawthorne. If something happens in my block, a block away, they came. I mean, it, it was not a problem. They are community officers and Hawthorne is picking up a big part of the cost. Beyond that, I know that they purchased, goodness, a license plate reader, they have purchased computers, they supply the internet, they supply the, the office itself. And I don't wanna mess that up. And so I called them and I asked them, has anybody from the city talked to them yet? And they said no. And I said, well, heads up, this is on the agenda. Gee whiz, I don't wanna upset this apple cart. Can you speak with us? And they are more than willing to speak with us. So at this point, I'm either against it or maybe postpone it to allow the city to speak with them because I mean I read the resolution and I don't see a good side to the city I see a bad side to the city and I want to avoid bad things happening to my neighborhood so well, that's my thought my thing about this is um, probably need to get the police chief um, you know if we have nobody or if we have one and we have to call patrol over there all the time uh, I'd like to know the numbers to uh, offset that because I think, you know, I think we're getting away cheap with two because we probably have to have 10 over there most of the time. If they're not present, what I'm getting, if they went to a private company or something, the first thing to do is call Independence Police. These guys out on patrol have to come over there and do their job you know, or vice versa, even with what we've got out there. I just, I think there's some, you know, I'd, I'd like to see them pay for what they get, but then on the other hand, I know what it's probably costing us three times more if we didn't have them there. Just yanking patrol, is that a true statement? I mean, what's your yeah. call out there? Excuse me. Um, Chief Police Brad Halsey. So yeah, let me give you a little background too. Back in the 90s, um, early 90s when I first came on, you didn't go in there without three cars. Um, after, you know, this has been many years of this partnership with them, but uh, I agree with what you said. They're not just responding officers, they're community officers. So. There's a lot of things that they do that is not measurable within that community, uh, the neighborhood, I should say, up there. So yes, if, if we don't have officers assigned there, yes, we, that's gonna impact the district officer that he or she works that area, 
plus the other districts that surround that as well. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Uh, I've got a question for Chief Halsey. Yes, sir. Um, are you familiar with the current deal that we have, the split of pay and the time officer spending all that? Are you familiar? You're familiar with all that out there? Yes. So, it is it, it? Would you recommend we keep it or not? Yes, keep it. Okay. It's a good partnership. Okay. Um, you know, combat's involved. Um, that whole area up there has became a pilot project, not just with the police department, but CSL, mm -hmm. Kappa. I mean, there's a lot of people involved, um, and they're actually using that now as a, as a model for the Fairmount uh, area as well. So my recommendation would be strongly to, yes, keep that partnership with them. It, is, it does work, and I think if we did something different, if we didn't have officers assigned up there full time, um, and again, I know that they're getting ready to invest a lot of money up there, and I think a lot of that, uh, I can't give specifics, but I know it's going to be security, additional security measures that they're going to take up there as well. So, And they're also, you're closing up two streets, and they're paying for the landscaping. Yes, yeah, so that was a partnership with the city. Um, and they were the two streets that when I lived there, those police reports on those two streets every, every night, I swear to God. So, so that's important. Mr. Perkins, you represented me back then. <laughs> yes, Councilwoman, I did have the great pleasure of representing you at, the, at, that, at that time, and, and I did hear those complaints. And, and it was also the, the time, too, as we're getting older here, Chief, when you're a patrol officer working on your sergeant stripes doing that, too. But, yes, absolutely, when I would do ride-alongs with Major Turner and, and uh, Michelle Sumstead and some of the others out there, we didn't go in there unless we had two and or three uh, officers available to, to bounce in there for sure. And uh, to your point, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tim, so I directed some questions to our city manager mid-Friday, and he responded back. So there are some good statistics here that he provided on calls for service. And as of right now, um, year to date, uh, we're looking at, um, can't put my glasses, they'll fog up. We're looking at uh, almost 868 calls for service right now. So we're on pace to have perhaps 1,600 calls for service. So of those calls for service, Chief, how many of those, uh, the two officers that are there uh, currently that work um, that, that we're discussing now respond to those calls for service? Probably a quarter percent, 20, oh, 50 percent? Yeah, um, if they're working, they're responding. If they're busy or if they're not working, obviously district officers, specialized units that are working, they respond. Um, so yeah, that's, that's calls for service for that entire area, the boundaries of Concord Circle, the north section, and also the right. south section. So the thing with this, this bill, and I talked to Councilman uh, Stewart a little bit about it, to me, it doesn't make much sense. The, the, the numbers we're talking about, off-duty hours, on-duty hours, all that stuff, makes no sense. Um, what we're looking at is possibly have a detrimental effect, one to the Hawthorne residents, to Salisbury Hills and to Susquehanna that overflows. So if we're gonna make these recommendations and the thoughts, we've gotta get the, the good foundation, the good understanding of our partnerships, the wraparound services, and see where this goes. Because looking long game, if we go with what Councilman Stewart is wanting to do to have a larger portion picked up, if we go with a doll, larger dollar amount per hour that is recommended here, then they can come back and negotiate then instead of us paying a larger portion we'll pay 50 percent you pay 50 percent so the city's out even more money than what we currently have now so there are some discussions and some concerns i have there with that so with this i would i will be voting no if this uh, comes forward for a straight vote and i have to uh, read what someone sent me the organization that that is running hawthorne they also fund the saving and housing accounts for the residents Yep. Community Service League is on site, That's right. and that is an organization that partners with the Hawthorne group. They're changing the residents' lives in, and helping them get out of Hawthorne. And I don't want to take funding from that, so I'm going to be voting no also. I think, um, uh, Ms. DeLucy, the, uh, uh, Doug from CSL, they, did, they had that big housing uh, homelessness presentation last year. I think he, they gave a story of a gal that was in there that they helped fund her first house purchase, mm -hmm. actually. Um, I have one more question uh, for Mr. Halsey or uh, Mr. Walker. 
uh, I believe you sent us some information that said there's there's two full-time officers and that's the split that we pay but then Hawthorne also pays additionally for two off off-duty officers is that right yes that's correct okay so they're really paying for what three out of four ultimately is that sort of a fair way to put it mr walker is that or close there with the the two full-time officers that work a regular shift they're assigned up there um hawthorne's paying one hundred eight thousand dollars which is 53 percent of the cost of the 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 officer's salary and benefits okay and then the city picks up the other 47 percent of that so it's not quite the full three but it's it's m more than half of that um first officer okay uh, the, the first full-time officer if you will gotcha so the reason i brought this up is because all right so if they were going to hire two off-duty officers which they have they would pay them 38 dollars an hour okay which would be about one hundred and fifty-eight thousand dollars a year, and that hundred and what did you say, one hundred and eight thousand? One hundred and eight thousand. Uh -huh. Doesn't come anywhere near that. You know, I don't have any problem with officers being at Hawthorne. It, I believe it's a good thing. Um, I mean, I live I live right next to there, <laughs> just like you used to. So, um, I just this is you know this contract was extended from 2010 so was the same contract in effect at 20 at 2010 yeah now the 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 dollar amounts have kind of changed. so we've been offering up the same base amending it but the, the dollar amount has increased so well, i just think minimal it, I, though council i'm still under the opinion that it needs to be renegotiated i know i'm on the losing end of this but that's my opinion mr city manager i we've talked a lot about they and this and them and, sure. and, and some organizations we're familiar with. This has had some um, downside in, in, in terms of understanding from constituents, the, this relationship with Hawthorne and how they're getting their funding and, and how the city was involved. And I, I asked you if you would be so kind so that we could kind of or, uh, clear the air on the confusion part of the of what took place, how that, how that committee is set up, who set them, sets them up, and, and where's the oversight for those? Right, so the Missouri state statutes, um, and I don't have the section in front of me, but the state legislature years ago created what's known as a industrial development authority. Uh, and cities around the state of Missouri uh, have this tool in their toolbox. When I say cities, though, the only authority you have with this as a city council, as a, the oversight body elected by the citizens, is to appoint the board for the Industrial Development Authority. That is it. The, the actions of the Industrial Development Authority are not subject to review by the city council or any other city entity. They stand wholly apart and separate from. Um, now the bonds, they, they have the authority to issue bonds to somebody who's looking to come in and do some kind of a project, like in this case it's a $43 million proposed renovation of the property. Um, the city does not back those bonds, we're not financially liable if the developer were to default on those bonds, but there, there is no oversight responsibility, no um, voting privilege for the council whatsoever other than appointing those members of the industrial development authority that is where it starts and ends and there's, there and there's no oversight from on this particular board correct no no and this is this is wholly created by state statute once the council fills out uh, a term appoints somebody to it that that is where the relationship ends and that board operates essentially in a vacuum at that point they they hear requests for um, issuing bonds. They make the decision of, you know, I guess, credit worthiness uh, and what other criteria they evaluate on, and they make those decisions, and then it's the developer who um, is responsible for making those payments uh, and is held liable if they default. So this 43 million is, is um, a loan that this group out of Boston has taken to do improvements and all the things that, that, that they're looking at in Hawthorne as well as fund the, the police protection? The, the loan for um, the $43 million Industrial Development Authority is strictly for the construction activity up there. So for 
renovations to the units, um, some improvements to the grounds, et cetera. So I don't believe they'll be using those resources to play for the police personnel exclusively. Um, I believe that's part of their other, the bonds that they sought were to make those construction activity improvements. Okay. And, and, there, and just, uh, and just to clear this up too. Sure. And so part of that also they're, they're purchasing the, the old quick trip on 24 highway as part of this too. Is that, is that right? Uh, I'm not certain. Um, that's what I, I'd heard. It, I don't know if that's right or not. And again, there's kind of the, the fallacy of this whole setup is, yeah, I'm not, I'm not certain exactly all the nature of what they're planning to do there. All right. Okay. I appreciate you clearing that up. I, I, I hope that uh, that does for the constituents who brought the concern to me. And, and I mean, I, not to belabor it, but I'm, I'm not familiar with another entities like that. The, the, the state statute created a tax increment financing, but you have a TIF commission. State statute created CIDs and community improvement districts, neighborhood improvement districts, 353s, chapter 100s, all of those come to the council. This is, to my knowledge, the only one that is not subject to a city council vote. And if, if they default on the 43, the city bears no responsibility. Zero, none other. whatsoever. That's a heck of a group. Yep. Yeah. Anyone else? <clears throat> Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I'm going to move approval of item 2759, although I will be voting against it. Second. Motion has been on, made on the floor and seconded on bill number 20. Dash 759, a resolution redirecting the city manager to negotiate the memorandum understanding between the City of Independence Hawthorne Associations and the POHAH community related to police coverage of Hawthorne Place Apartments. City, Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilman Vershoff? Yes. I mean, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Perkins? No. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? No. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? No. Nope. Motion failed. All righty. Okay. Finally, I get to my last one, I hope. <laughs> Number six, Mr. City Manager, resolution declaring the intent of the City Council to enter into a tax exempt lease to pay for fire and technology equipment. Could you just give a, the citizens and us a little brief presentation? Two, two aspects to this. Number one, the fire truck. Um, this is an asset um, aerial apparatus that the department is in need of um, rather than purchasing outright one of the ways that we are proposing um, to balance the fire sales tax fund in light of the revenue downturn from COVID is to do a lease rather than a purchase. We'd rather purchase, but at least we can spread out the cost rather than the significant uh, upfront cost. The technology equipment aspect of it are the three items that we discussed up above earlier this evening. Um, again, spreading those costs out over five to eight years. So what this is, is declaring an intent to enter into. This is not binding the council tonight, but this is the first step in doing debt financing as the council giving off the signal to the bond market that you're intending to um, pursue a debt issue. And the charter allows it, correct? And the charter allows this. Uh -huh. Thank you. Anyone else? I move approval of item six. Second. Second. There's been a motion on the floor and seconded for <clears throat> bill number 20-760 resolution declaring the official intent of the city council to enter into a tax exempt lease to pay for certain fire and technology equipment. Madam City Clerk. Council Member Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. That moves us to, uh, oh, wait a minute. Mr. Uh, Councilman Steinmeier, did you have one? No, it was already covered. Okay. That moves us to the public hearings. Uh, the first one is a public hearing for the application of FWP Properties LLC requesting a rezoning from C2 General Commercial to R6 single family residence for the property located at 2415 South Artie Mize Road. This is new information only. Um, Mr. Scannell. Maybe now. Yes, 
Is there any way, uh, pardon me, Mr. Scannell, is there any way we could, can we, can we turn that, is there any way to get a better volume anywhere? Tom, are you there? Mr. City Manager, as we're kind of waiting here, sure. in the future, is there any possibilities if we know that we have a massive agenda of public hearings that we can have our staff waiting in the wings, if you will, and, and walk forward? Yeah, we'll work to address that. Really, we just need to know if there's any more information. And then, and then you ask if anybody wants to speak. Well, information you don't have to. It's just on the Try again, Tom. Well, but this is a public hearing. And oh, really? Okay. Okay. All right. This is one of those. Considering we can't hear him, I don't think we're doing anything. This is just the 2020 has been terrible. We might have we might have done it and I forgot. Okay. Okay. Today. Okay. I woke up. I slept pretty good. I woke up exhausted. I took a nap. Still exhausted. I no idea. This year is terrible. That's all I gotta say. Oh. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, we're going to try to innovate here. Go ahead, Tom. Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council, my name is Tom Scannell. I'm the community community development director, and this rezoning was considered by the planning commission at their June 9th planning commission meeting. The planning commission voted uh, in favor of this application and there is no new information to report on this case. Hearing closed. Is there anyone that'd like to uh, have anything to say about this, council members? That's, uh, Madam City Clerk. Bill number 20-048, an ordinance approving a rezoning from District C2 General Commercial to District R6 single family residential for the property at 2415 South Artie Mize Road in Independence, Missouri. Second and final reading. Any discussion? Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. That brings us to the next public hearing. Uh, this is an application by PAL CWM requesting a rezoning from R6 single family residential to C2 general commercial to C3 
service commercial for the property located at 603 U.S. 24 Highway and 909 North Emory C, uh, Street. Uh, new information only. Mr. Scannell. Yes, Mayor uh, Pro Tem and members of the council, Tom Scannell, Community Development Director. Uh, this rezoning application was considered by the Planning Commission at the June 9th Planning Commission meeting. The Planning Commission heard all of the testimony and there's no new information to report on this rezoning. Hearing close, is there any discussion on this? If none, Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Bill number 20-049, an ordinance approving a rezoning from districts R6, single family residential, and C2, general commercial, to district C3, service commercial, for the property at 603 East US 24 Highway and 909 North Emory Street in Independence, Missouri. Second and final reading. Discussion? Please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. It brings us to our next public hearing. This public hearing is for application by Doug Shrout requesting a rezoning from C1 Neighborhood Commercial to R1 Residential Agricultural for the property located at 2000 North Elsie Smith Road. This is new information only. Mr. Scannell. Yes, Mayor Pro Tems and member of the council. This is Tom Scannell, Community Development Director. This rezoning was considered by the Planning Commission at the June 23rd Planning Commission meeting. The Planning Commission heard all of the, the testimony and they voted in favor of this application. There is no new information to report on this rezoning. Is there any discussion? Hearing closed, Madam City Clerk. Bill number 20-050, an ordinance approving a rezoning from District C1 Neighborhood Commercial to District RA Residential Agriculture for the property at 2000 North L.C. Smith Road in Independence, Missouri, second and final reading. Is there any discussion? Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. This brings us to our next hearing. It's an application by CDD Independence requesting a preliminary development plan to construct a home for the developmental disabled at 2740 East Inglewood Terrace. This is new information only. Mr. Scannell. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council, this is Tom Scannell. Uh, this preliminary development plan was considered by the Planning Commission at their June 23rd Planning Commission meeting. The Planning Commission heard all of the, the evidence. Uh, they voted in favor of this uh, preliminary development plan, and there is no new information to report. Any discussion? Hearing closed. Madam City Clerk. Bill number 20-051, an ordinance approving a preliminary development plan for the Center for the De Developmentally Disabled at 2740 and 2742 South Inglewood Terrace, second and final reading. Any discussion? Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. This brings us to our last hearing. It's a public hearing for, uh, for the formation of the Independent Square Community Improvement District. This is a full public hearing. Mr. Mark Randall. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here this evening to talk about this next item, uh, proposed community improvement district for the square. Uh, on uh, June 30th, uh, the city clerk received a petition signed by property owners on the square asking this council to, uh, to approve the establishment of a community improvement district. That petition was signed by a majority of property owners all, and those also represent a majority of the assessed valuation of property on the square. Uh, the process for creating community improvement districts is set out as it is mentioned in your packet there in by state law, uh, it's a statute, uh, it's the community improvement district bill which is part of RSMO 67.1401. As you know, community improvement districts have uh, really played a big role in our community. Uh, Nolan Road, CID, you saw some of their uh, contributions at your last meeting. 
you approved the Nolan Road, I mean the uh, Inglewood CID just uh, not that long ago. And of course the Event Center CID is, uh, is something you well know. So they're a very important tool in economic development. And uh, we feel like this one is going to be very important. Uh, this one has, uh, now a, a community improvement district in a downtown area specifically is a very important thing in particular. Communities all across the state have used CIDs as a big tool for downtown revitalization. And that's what the downtown property owners here are wanting to do on the square. So if approved by the council, this would create a community improvement district. They would then proceed to conduct a special mail-in sales tax election to try to get, to ask the registered voters in that district to create a one cent sales tax that would only be collected in that district and the money would only be going to the purposes outlined in that petition. So that's an important thing to, to note. What you do tonight just creates a district. It does not establish the sales tax yet. That has to be done by a separate action. If that sales tax election were to pass, this would generate about $76,000 a year to be used for purposes that are allowed by state statute and that are mentioned in that petition that you have in your packet. What they're planning to do with those funds are make improvements, some of which are really gonna supplement that future street, streetscape project that we hope to do on the square at some point. What they'll be doing is things that maybe the city won't have to do in future. They'll be buying benches and trash cans. They'll be doing all the landscaping. They'll be maintaining that landscaping in perpetuity. They'll be doing these things. They'll be doing artwork, banners, promotion of the square. They'll be doing a lot of things with that money. And uh, that's why this could be such a valuable economic development tool. Now, as you know, we have an economic development policy with the city. And one of the provisions of that economic development policy is that anything, any incentive or even special districts go to the Economic Development and Incentives Commission to make a recommendation to the council. So this proposed square CID went to the EDIC on July 15th. They evaluated it, and as you know, the EDIC has representatives from all the other taxing jurisdictions in independence, school districts, uh, libraries, et cetera, the county. So they voted to recommend to you to approve uh, this square CID. The vote was six to one. Uh, the uh, that policy sets forth a number of minimum criteria that a CID has to meet. It, this meets all of them. And it also has a number of additional criteria which if, if it satisfies those, it would be what would be considered a most favored status. And this gets almost all of those as well that apply to this particular, develop, this particular plan. So the EDIC voted to recommend to you to approve this CID plan. Uh, the city staff concurs with that recommendation and urge you to approve it. But we also have tonight at this public hearing, we have some property owners from the square here in attendance who would like to take advantage of this public hearing opportunity to come and explain to you why they think this is a very important thing for the revitalization of the square. So Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, if, uh, if you'd like, should, if, with your permission, we can call some of them forward to uh, Sure, at this time, uh, any, any, any individuals that would uh, and be in support are welcome to speak. Mayor Pro Tim, uh, members of the council, my name is Austin Conley, um, 206 North Liberty Street. Uh, I'm here tonight not only as a petition signer, but as a resident, property owner, and business owner within the proposed Independent Square Community Improvement District. Mr. Randall's done a, a phenomenal job of explaining to, uh, to you guys what a SID is, so I'm not gonna try to bore you with that. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background as to how we got here. Uh, approximately two years ago, the Independent Square Association joined the Missouri Main Street Program as an affiliate community member. For those of you that don't know, the National Main Street Program was originally established as a program under the National Trust for Historic Preservation around 1980 to help the issues facing historic downtowns across our country at that time. They studied downtowns that had not only survived the flight from our historic downtowns to shopping malls in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they thrived. 
As the common traits of these historic downtowns became more and more apparent, they began to share their transformation strategies with communities across the country that had not fared so well through these times. And have been doing so just that for 30 plus years. Uh, notable communities that have completed the program and become accredited downtowns by the Missouri Main Street program are Lee Summit, Excelsior Springs, Cape Girardeau, Washington, Liberty, just to name a few. I think we can all agree that those areas do a great job at not only preserving their historic downtowns, but also creating an environment that people want to continue to live, work, and do business in. As we vid visited these communities and had conversations with their stakeholders about successful projects in their downtown, many of them had the same answers of how they got it done with community improvement districts. They all have beautiful downtown street caves with cohesive lighting, benches, trash cans, wayfinding signage, the little things that we all take for granted, but that make a big difference and a lasting impression on visitors to our downtown and making them want to return. With the assistance of a CID, these communities had found ways not only to fund these new projects, to make their downtowns more beautiful and functional, but to help maintain previous projects that have become neglected over the years. And we have a myriad of those here uh, on the square. As we, we turn, as we returned from these trips, we knew that there, this was something that we could do on the square that would not only help in the short term, but for years to come. What we as the majority of property owners within this district are asking you to consider is very simple a 1% sales tax on all retail goods sold within this district to go back to help our downtown. We've seen this this is, that this is a strategy that works in historic downtowns, not only across our state, but across the country, and we believe that this is vital to our success for going forward. I wanna thank you all very much for your time, um, and there will be people speaking behind me that are much more eloquent than I am, but thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Austin. Is anyone else in favor would like to speak? and raised in Independence. Could you speak up just a little bit more? Sure. My name is Danielle Dupree Crawford. I was born and raised in Independence. I've spent 13 summers of my life on the Independence Square uh, working at my church. And uh, I have a lot of fond memories growing up on the square. And now that I'm a mom, I have many tra traditions with my family. We celebrate many life um, achievements and uh, events on the square. And so one thing I noticed is we have all these great things on the square and no one knows about them. Anytime I would post on social media about attending an event on the square, everyone's like, how did you know about that? Well, I know how to go find information about it. Um, I know every year these events are coming, so I know go online, look at, look at things, but there's no advertising for them. Um, I approached Judy Krantz saying, well, how can I help the Independence Square? Because I love this place so much. So she asked me to join the Economic Vitality Committee for the Independence Square. And I joined it in December. And when I joined, they were, uh, you know, a couple years in the making of this CID for the Independence Square. And I thought this was the perfect thing for me to come and, and support. So that's why I'm here today. Um, this is a group, this committee is a group of very professional, extraordinary people who love our town and what they're proposing is a great thing and I just throw my support behind it and I hope that you guys do too. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. Is there anyone else? Uh, we also have one by virtue that would like to speak, Mr. Rogers. Yes. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council. I hope you're able to hear me. Yes, we can hear um, you. I'm Jeff Rogers. Great. I jinxed in. I'm executive director of the Independent Square Association, and tonight I'm representing many of our investor partners. Um, who are petitioners of this CID, as well as business owners who will be collecting this tax and who are supportive of this initiative. The area will be comprised of uh, 240 individual parcels, 129 unique owners, over 1,000 employees, dozens of residents, and that number continues to grow daily. 
surrounding neighborhoods, including the historic McCoy neighborhood, are greatly impacted by the economic vitality of our downtown, as well as the restoration, upkeep, and beautification of the district. Within the Independent Square Association and our association with Main Street, um, we have um, created a use of best practices related to program design, transparency, accountability, and efficiency led by a capable and experienced staff and an engaged and very representative board of directors. Um, we hope to help work with the new jurisdiction to eliminate any duplication of efforts that may occur to create a larger common vision and to coordinate the execution of shared priorities. The petitioners see the need for upkeep and maintenance of public amenities in the area, including litter control, weed abatement, sidewalk, curb, and street washing and cleaning. We do know that uh, this district is the host of many major festivals like Santa Caligon, the Island Festival, most major parades, and other place-making events. Um, landscaping, general cleaning and beautification. For example, our bronze sidewalk walking tour. It yeah, has beautiful plaques that are embedded into the sidewalk, but there's really not a mechanism to make sure that those are unkept and often they are oxidized and difficult to read. Trash and recycling receptacles, bike racks, street furniture, flower urns, directional and informational signage, banners and banner arms, public art, all of those things um, currently exist. The area is also an economic generator, employing over 1,000 people and hosting over 100,000 visitors yearly, not counting the crowds of parades and festivals, which would pitch that number over half a million. Funds could help with marketing of the district for commercial, historical, cultural, and artistic attractions. They could also be used to support other economic development initiatives, recruiting additional businesses to not only the retail and office space of the area, but the surrounding warehouse space in the expanding residential market. In the last several years, there's been a move toward increased residential space, including second floor renovations. The increased residences lead to more regular patrons of all the businesses in the district, including the services, restaurants, shops, and attractions. The use of a SID that only collects sales tax is a way to ensure that many who contribute to the wear and tear of the district also contribute to its upkeep. Tourists, festival attendees and patrons of retail and restaurants will ensure that public amenities are maintained for future visitors as well. There are SIDs in nearly every major shopping area in Independence outside of the square. These funds help ensure gateway entrances are maintained, shared signage is upkept, public amenities are available. SIDs make sure there are designated funds and a dedicated board to oversee this task. Nearly every Main Street community in Missouri also uses this public funding to help with the upkeep of their historic districts. From downtown Lee Summit to downtown Liberty, from Washington to St. Charles, from Chillicothe to Clinton, community improvement districts help create a shared means of maintaining the historic heart of the community. It won't eliminate the need for volunteers, donations, and fundraising. ISA will continue to lead those efforts, but it will expand what is currently available. I walked for four blocks after picking up a soda can in front of the Memorial Building one day before I came to the first trash can. A local small business donated the time of their employees to remove weeds from the curbing throughout the district just last week. And in a few places, like along the, the property of the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office, where the pavement meets the sidewalk, there were weeds over two feet high. And there is so much more that could be done. One of our trail markers, the 1849 site of the Wesson Blacksmith Shop, was erected by the Daughters of the American Revolution in 1926. It's currently backdropped by a porta potty. It's impossible to take a photo at that site without seeing the porta potty. The visitor kiosk at Truman and Maine has been there for over a decade, but it's in need of maintenance. Part of it was painted black, but only as high as someone could reach. The posters inside are over a decade old, and the landscaping is filled with weeds. It sits directly across from the National Park Service and is one of the most highly seen sites of our national and international tourists. We'd like to help care for the district that houses our historic treasures. We want visitors to be impressed by the pride that the community demonstrates, by how not only the historic buildings are kept, but also 
by the setting in which they're presented. The district needs a funding source to ensure that this is ongoing. We appreciate your time this evening. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Is, is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Dominic? Laura Dominic, 3525 Blue Ridge Boulevard. Different math. <laughs> <laughs> no one else write it down just so you can hear me. Um, I'm either for or against this proposal. Just a couple of things, questions that have come to mind as I'm listening tonight. Um, how much will a special election cost the city um, if this were to go to a special election? I believe that's what Mr. Randolph said. Oh, he's saying zero, so the answer is that is zero. That was fast. <laughs> um, the second question um, I have is, uh, this is not me not doing my due diligence because I just was thinking about this item. What will that, break, a 1% increase, what will be the total sales tax rate then for retail items? Oh. I could look that up on my own, but I'm nope. just thinking of the question now. I believe it's 8.85 cents. Okay, and that's, and that's it. I mean, I can look it up tomorrow, but I think that's currently 7.85. Very good. Um, and then um, um, the gentleman who was just on the Zoom meeting mentioned that there are lots where there are le weeds growing that aren't being cut and things like that and um, some other things. And I'm sorry, I was typing my thoughts and listening to him. Um, I'm just kind of curious why is there, are there people, business owners who are not being held to city codes, for instance, for noxious weeds and weed overgrowing? Um, I do, like I said, I'm neither for nor against this CID, but it sounds like some of the things that he mentioned are maybe some things that we already have um, ordinances in place that maybe we need to um, look at closely, make sure those are getting enforced, whether or not we raise the sales tax uh, to pay for the other nice things. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Dominic. Is there anyone that would like to speak that opposes this? If not, hearing is closed. Are there any comments or questions from the Mr. Council member? Mayor Pro Tem. Go ahead, Mr. Perkins. Thank you. This uh, body saw, about a, saw the wisdom about a year ago to, to vote the uh, Inglewood CID in for all the, the reasons that these speakers spoke so eloquently about. The difference here is this is our heart of our town. This is the um, uh, center of our town. This is our main street. This is the ability to revitalize, refresh, and get into a partnership here to boost the beautification. When we get on the other side of this COVID um, scenario that we have here, that we can start attracting the individuals, the tourism. So this is a good tool, good arm to help us do that. So we will not be voting tonight on that, but it will be coming up in two weeks for, for a vote. And I'll again be speaking on that as well. But I would encourage my, my colleagues to vote in favor for this, to keep the ball rolling and keep this enthusiasm going. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Go ahead. Mr. City Manager, this is the oddest map I have ever seen of a CID. I mean, seriously, it goes all the way down Maple to someplace. Why? There's no businesses all the way down Maple. That's all residential. Yeah, I'm going to have um, Assistant City Manager Mark Randall come back up okay. and try that. Yes, uh, and that is, there's a convenience store at the end of that. So they're, what they're trying to do is capture commercial property and not residential property, but uh, and that there's a, a convenience store at the end of that. And I did want to say- Did he you sign your petition? Yes. The but convenience store did? I'm sorry, what? It's in, on the district map. It's on, in there, yeah. I know, it's just, it goes one, two, three blocks on Maple, which is all residential, in order to get to the convenience store. Yeah, but it, it's not, including the residences. Well, it's it just, does. No, it's just taking the right away. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if I rent a spot at the city-owned memorial building and I sell widgets, are my customers at the memorial building paying this tax? Because the memorial building is on Maple. Well, I, I tell you what, I'm no expert on sales tax collection, but if you have a sales tax point of sale, whatever sales tax is collected in that district would include this. It would now be 8.85 instead of the 7.75 or 7.85. No. Why are we doing a SID and not a NID? 
Why a community improvement well, district community and not a neighborhood improvement well, district? Community improvement district is a lot more flexible than neighborhood improvement district. It, it's just uh, it, it, by state statute, it has a lot more flexibility it, on how the money is. And it goes on forever. No, this one has a 30 year sunset, but. A NID is, is terminated. Well, usually Once NID, an item well, is per purchased. A NID, a NID usually is for a specific project. Right. What usually a NID is is if, if uh, the property owner signed a, a neighborhood improvement district petition is to do a project, the city issues the bonds to do the project, then the people pay it off through a special assessment process right. over a period of time to reimburse the city for the bonds that the Correct. city issues. That's a totally different use. That might be a great use for something, like if you're building a bridge or something in an area, it's, but not for this. They're going to use this money for ongoing things of beautification, maintenance, landscaping, promotion. These sorts so of does They're this take really the place project. of the Independent Square Association that is $29,000 sitting in a bank account and has been for months? I'm sorry, what was the question? The, the Independent Square Association has $29,000 sitting in a bank account and it has sat there for months. Well, Will this take the place of the Square Association or is that tax this, in addition to this CID? This will supplement the Square Association. So we're having two taxes. Well, you're talking about the Square Association or you're talking about the Square Benefit District? Benefit District, sorry. The Square Benefit District is a property tax base. Right. And it generates about $29,000 every year. Right. It is used for things like that's how they do their Christmas lights and some other things. I believe that's right. Uh, Austin is actually on the board there, and he could probably talk a lot better about what the benefit district does. But that is a limited amount of money that can only do so much. What they're wanting to do is to do more. Okay, so. And do more with it. That, so the benefit district is a totally different thing, which I think great if Austin could tell you a little bit about that. But I did want to say before he comes up here, thank uh, uh, Councilman Perkins for your leadership on this end to say thank you very much for reminding everyone that the, this is a two-step process. This is just first reading. Right. Holy hearing tonight, first reading. Second reading would be August 3rd, I believe. Right. right? Okay. Thank you okay. very much for so, so, on so here's my question. Okay. The Independent Square Tax Benefit District collects a tax on certain properties. Right. And that money is used for just things within that district. Right and the money spent is determined by that board. Correct. It is a different board than the CID board. Right, although they could cooperate. I and understand that. They will. The I understand that. They've actually signed a memorandum of understanding between two organizations similar to that so that they would work great. Work I got great. it. Yeah. So, with this 1% on top of that tax, is it still just going to be the 8.85 or is yes. it going to be benefit, more than that? No, the benefit district is property tax. This is a sales tax. So we're having a, real, a special real estate tax on this property you have, yes. plus no, no. a special retail sales this tax. This does not do anything about the property tax. That's something that already exists in the benefit district. I this know that. This is a sales tax based community improvement district which will be based on economic activity with the tourists and visitors there. They'll be the ones <coughs> mostly paying that. But the other is everybody that owns property pays for the benefit district, but it only generates $29,000 a year. And I, am, that's why I got that. So how many places in the city of Independence do we have a tax on the property plus a tax on the retail sales in addition to the usual tax on the retail sales? You know, I didn't, I didn't anticipate that question. I question I that, and I'd like to know an answer to there that question. There are some places that overlapping uh, CIDs and TDDs, I know. Uh, I know, I think there's a, the Frackenack, I believe, has got one. Has that. But anyway, we'll double check that. I'd, I'd appreciate that. that. that Thank up. you. Sorry. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, if, if oh. go ahead. Sorry. Just to uh, muddy up the water even more. Uh, Councilwoman, this is <laughs> this is very similar, minus the, the property tax. This is very similar, actually exactly the same, minus the maps and some of the different nuances that we voted on about a year ago in the Inglewood. 1% mm -hmm. sales tax, that would be collected on point of sale. Um, the CID is its own political entity by state statutes. They have their own governing board, their own, um, all, all that protections and all that. They have to res uh, respond to the state. They have to respond to us. So it's exactly set up the same that... Uh, think was the idea was set up if that helps clarify. Got it. Okay. Thank you. 
Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I had a question. Um, how many residents, okay, this is if we're going to a vote of the residents, how many residents are in that district that would vote on it? number I think I thought it was about 30 but perhaps uh, Austin could come up well, last time that we checked, this has been an ongoing process um, for about a year and a half by this committee um, the last time that we looked with the election board it was approximately 35 ish uh, registered voters now that was before um, a lot of the townhomes had sold that number continues to increase we anticipate it somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50 residents within the district but until the council makes their decision um, we won't be working with the election board to know exactly how many of those are uh, within the district at this time, but it's approximately 50. And it just takes a majority to pass? I do believe so, yes. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? That'll take us to the second readings. Madam City Clerk. Bill number 20-045, an ordinance vacating an existing five-foot sanitary easement recorded in book 1478 at page 18 of the Jackson County Deed Records and located at 11004 East 40 Highway. Second and final reading. Any discussions on this bill? Madam Mayor, please, or Madam <laughs> City Clerk, please call the roll. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Motion uh, passes. Bill number 20-046, an ordinance vacating an existing 15-foot sanitary easement recorded in book 1478 at page 18 of the Jackson County Deed Records and located at 11004 East 40 Highway. Second and final reading. Any discussion on this bill? <laughs> Madam City Clerk. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Bill passes. Bill number 20-047, an ordinance vacating an existing 15-foot utility easement recorded on instrument number 2014E0029183, book 149, page 83 of the Jackson County Deed Records and located at 11004 East 40 Highway. Second and final reading. Any discussion on this bill? Madam City Clerk. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Bill passes. Bill number 20-052, an ordinance authorizing a contract with the Department of Justice for the 2020 Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Program in the amount of $133,415, appropriating the necessary funds in the police department operating budget making the necessary appropriations, authorizing future change orders for additional funding and or time extensions, and authorizing certain future appropriations. Second and final reading. Any discussion on this bill? Madam City Clerk? Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Bill passes. Bill number 20-053, an ordinance finding, determining, and declaring the necessity of acquiring temporary construction and grading easements for the Bison Park Sanitary Sewer Improvements Project, project number 302003, authorizing the negotiation and eminent domain proceedings if necessary, approving the plans and specifications for the project, authorizing the use of experts as needed, authorizing and directing the execution of documents and the payment of funds to property owners, or others holding property rights in conjunction with the project. Second and final reading. Any discussion? Madam City Clerk. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Bill passes. That'll take us to our first readings. Madam City Clerk. Bill number 20-054, an ordinance authorizing acceptance of a grant in the amount of $263,091 from the Missouri Department of Transportation for reimbursement of overtime for the police department for a crash investigation software license, stalker, radar units, LETSAC conference fees, and hazardous moving violations enforcement from October 1st, 2020 to September 30th, 2021 authorizing future change orders, extensions, amendments, or addendums for additional funding for the same project and making the necessary appropriations. Bill number 20-055, an ordinance authorizing acceptance of a grant in the amount of $456,250 
from the Missouri Department of Transportation for reimbursement of overtime for the Police Department for impaired driving enforcement and youth alcohol liquor compliance checks from October 1st, 2020 to September 30th, 2021, authorizing future change orders and or time extensions for the same project and making the necessary appropriations. Bill number 20-056, an ordinance dedicating a 20-foot general utility easement to the Little Blue Valley Sewer District across their property at 21101 East 78 Highway. Bill number 20-057, an ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to execute a certain contract for the sale of real estate in exchange for payment of $1,500 for land designated as city surplus property at 11323 East 15th Street South and to do all the things necessary to consummate said sale. Bill number 20-058, an ordinance concurrently de-annexing certain abutting lands at the southeast corner of Argo Road and Seven Highway with the city of Blue Springs, Missouri and authorizing and directing the city clerk to do those things necessary to accomplish said action. Bill number 20-059, an ordinance approving the establishment of the Independent Square Community Improvement District. That brings us to number seven, which is an emergency to be read twice. So, Madam City Clerk. Bill number 20-507, an ordinance authorizing the City of Independence, Missouri to enter into an equipment lease purchase agreement with Motorola Solutions, Inc the proceeds of which will be used to pay the cost of acquiring certain radio equipment and to approve the execution of certain documents in connection therewith and declaring an emergency. Bill number 20-507, an ordinance authorizing the City of Independence, Missouri to enter into an equipment lease purchase agreement with Motorola Solutions, Inc., the proceeds of which will be used to pay the cost of acquiring certain radio equipment and to approve the execution of certain documents in connection therewith and declaring an emergency. Second and final reading. Is there any discussion on this bill? I just have a question for Mr. City Manager. Um, for the citizens benefit, the city of Blue Springs and Central Jackson County are partners with us in this. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, are they paying the same amount as us? I mean, when you say they're partners with us, what does that mean? Yeah, so um, the citizens may uh, know where our police headquarters is located. Um, just a few steps from here at the corner of Truman and Noland Road. And we'll see atop of that building a large radio tower. Um, the city has capacity um, uh, beyond what we need on that tower, so we lease out use to um, surrounding jurisdictions. Um, even some of our own internal departments make use of the radio frequency off of there. So we've we've leased out, um, and then they pay a pro rata amount based on their um, community size for that use of that tower. Thank you. And one thing on this, Mr. City Manager, I was looking at the numbers. I was trying to determine um, how these are put out for pay. For instance, I noticed the water company in power light was 40,000 and the police were 21,000. I just trying to figure out how that was determined. Is it about the, man, the amount of time on the radio? Is it the amount of radios? What, what is the determining factor there? Um, I catch a lot of grief on this individuals and stuff about the 6% reduction in rates that I'm bankrupt and uh, bankrupt power and light but I'm seeing this I'm just seeing this for some justification on how we figure this thing out I uh, I would say on the any rate decrease stuff all these costs have been factored into the adopted budget and um, uh, these won't be you know adverse impacts financially and um, as far as the cost allocation it does Base off utilization. I did have a um, dialogue with the, um, I don't know the person's official title, the person over technology and power and light, and an individual named John George, and he assures me that these costs were reviewed independently by power and light and certified that they are appropriate and to form and, and they're not being gouged or taken advantage of. Um, so um, I can get the council more information about um, number of radios per department and stuff. Um, I don't have that count in front of me tonight, but I did get assurances from each of these departments individually that they're being appropriately allocated. Sure, thank you. Anyone else? Madam City Clerk. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. That uh, brings us to the councilman comments. Councilman Stewart, we'll start over there. No comments. Councilman Perkins. Nothing tonight. Councilman Hobart. Uh, 
Yes, uh, briefly, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> I, this is uh, really a comment for the uh, community and, and residents of Independence. You know, Jackson County has instituted a required mask. Well, you have to wear a mask if you go into a store. And I have personally seen, you know, arguments and some consternation between folks that don't want to wear a mask. And they're always, the ones I've seen, it's a subjective thing, I get that. But, you know, I hate to see folks that are working a retail job. It's hard enough they have to wear a mask. It's hard enough that they have to work, you know, at times when some of us haven't had to, at least, around a lot of people that could be, you know, uh, stressful and to see them get argued with and yelled at and sort of berated by folks <clears throat> just for showing up to do their job. I, I, I really, um, uh, I just feel bad about that. And I, I'd like to see uh, just for the citizens of independence, uh, I, I'm not making a comment on whether you agree with wearing a mask or not. And I'm not making a comment on, on anybody's rights as they would, you know, define them. What I'm asking is uh, for folks that pay attention to this, that you consider who your argument is with. And please treat the folks uh, with respect and kindly the folks that are showing up to go to work every day and, and make it so you can buy gas and, you know, groceries and uh, you know, lumber at the, at the lumber store. So that's my comment. I, I'm just encouraging folks to go forward with some respect and kindness to each other, especially just regular old folks like us workers at these places. And that's it. Councilman Steinmeier. Yes. Um, Mr. City Manager, I appreciate the fact that you put the, uh, uh, under the information only the COVID-19 semi-monthly updates uh, so that we can use this information really to gauge for our city uh, where we stand in this pandemic. And it's good to have information so that we know how to make decisions that's best suited for our city and our residents. Um, I think that um, part of, as, as I just since this seems to be the, the focus of everybody's attention and discussions, uh, it's been brought to my attention that um, perhaps this is a good time for us to begin as a council to discuss the resurrection of our health department in our city. A charter says there shall be a health department in our city and, it, and it's quite clear how it's to be laid out. And I think in the time that we've needed information for ourselves to take care of our people. We've relied on Jackson County, and I'm not sure that that's been the best tool uh, for us to measure where we're at. And we have to be leaders and we have to lead with good, reliable information for our city. And I think we miss our health department. And I think it's time for us to begin having that conversation to resurrect it. And I wanted to ask you tonight what is the steps that we would need to begin to look into uh, bringing life back to our, uh, our uh, to a city health department? That's my first question, okay? Uh, I listened to the Health Advisory Board uh, last week. They did a fantastic job, very informative. If you haven't listened to it, I'd ask you to take the time to do so. And I was wondering if there's a way that possibly we could have them meet since we don't have the, the luxury of a health department right now, that if there's a way that maybe they could meet monthly to help us uh, gain more information and, and uh, do the, um, the research and bring uh, professional opinion on what, what we should be doing for our residents. I think it'd be important to do that and uh, so I, I want to ask you first, can you give us the steps that would be necessary to begin to look at having a resurrected health department? Certainly. Um, let me begin, please, by also thanking for the recommendation to add the, the COVID report. That's 
data that we've been looking at internally and, and through the regional conversations we've been having, but to compile that specifically for our community and for Eastern Jackson County, um, I, I think you're right, it's helpful to have that dialogue with the community to help understand why decisions are being made that are being made, what are the goals we're trying to get. And so I hope folks will spend some time with that document and, and look at that you know, every two weeks when we publish this for the council. Um, that is going to be made available on the website and we'll put some information out about where to find that once we get that posted on there. Um, a couple of years ago when we made our um, decisions with the, the health department, we, we knew that we have the charter requirement to fulfill those duties. Um, and that's why we were, we were cautious about how we went about that. We, um, and, and I'll give just a, a brief summary since we've had some turnover in the council since that time, but the, the, there were some responsibilities that I would say were very core to public health and there were other responsibilities that were somewhat superfluous. All of them important, but some core to, to public health, some superfluous. We, we've, some of the things that were more superfluous um, or duplicative, I might even say, we partnered with the county on. So for example, printing off of vital records, a birth certificate, a death certificate. We had staff we were paying to do that at our health department. A few blocks away, the county was doing the exact same thing. We turned that responsibility over to the county and I don't think anybody would, would say they particularly missed that. Some of the items also, we tried to find where they maybe had greater synergy within our organization. So some of the wellness related activities thought we met, made sense with our parks and recreation department because those are where those recreational and well-being assets are at. Um, the code enforcement, property maintenance code enforcement, we saw a lot of disconnect um, between the activities community development was doing and the health department. So by putting those together, we saw some, some more synergy there as well. Some of the um, health enforcement activities um, with business licensing and regulated industries, there were some synergies there. But what, what I would say we've, we feel like, you know, especially in the midst of this public health crisis, are these communicable disease issues um, and, and disease prevention issues. Um, those, were, again, were items that we were duplicating with the county. At the time, we thought we, it would make sense to um, form that partnership and empower. Um, lessons learned on that, I think uh, we would be able to tell the council tonight we, we wish we had that um, information flowing to us. Um, so while we still have our, our, our designation under the charter as a health department, what we lack is an official recognition from the state of Missouri as a local public health agency or LPHA. Um, we've begun to have some of those conversations, um, quite frankly, with our partners at Jackson County as well about how do we as the city carve out the best path for us and, and how do we um, reproach the state um, to have those conversations about having a local public health agency. So um, the Board of Health talked about this uh, a, a couple of meetings ago. Um, our foot has been set upon that path, um, but ultimately what that requires is recognition from the state of Missouri as a local public health agency performing the core duties of a public health department in which then we would receive the grant funding to perform those duties. And, and we're very interested in learning what the state will require of us to get that designation um, so that in the unfortunate event, similar situations were to unfold, we would be able to maybe chart our own path or control our own destiny to a greater degree than what we're doing right now. So we are in a discussion of that, or we've at least we, we, we are. to we, move we, forward we, in that? We have, we've, um, many of the folks who are, are public health experts on our staff who were responsible for um, helping restructure those duties at the time. We're pulling those same folks back around the table and saying, what do we need to do to bring those core functions back that get us that recognition? So we're doing some of our internal prep work right now. We've expanded the circle a little bit, like I said, to start having those conversations with our partners at Jackson County Health Department. And then the ultimate goal is to go have that conversation with the State Department of Health and Senior Services and understand what that would take for us. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that we're at least discussing it. If you could update us um, you know at each council meeting that would be wonderful as to the progress of that uh, that would be a, a good thing for us also I wanted to just remind us that the um, pandemic relief funds those six hundred dollar a week checks are coming to an end come next week uh, independence the last I checked had an unemployment rate of 13.6 we have people that are falling off of the unemployment rolls now Missouri's only a 13-week unemployment state, so we're going to see a rise in, in need, I believe, in, in our community. So I, I'd like to keep that in mind. 
And I was going to ask you if there's ways in a study session that you can bring to us um, a report on revenues coming into the city and what we're spending out every bi monthly. So at the study sessions, if there's a way to do that, since we are uh, mandated by the charter to keep the, you know, to keep the council informed uh, of the financial condition, condition and future needs of our city, I would just ask that if you could begin to bring us revenue uh, information and where it where it's uh, lined up with our revenue projections that we have in our new budget. Yeah, um, and I failed to mention on your, you're also asked about the advisory board of health. Sorry, monthly. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to not let that go. Yeah. The, those groups, all of those boards and commissions are advisory to the council. They're here to help guide you. And right. so if that is something that you would like us to coordinate with them, um, our staff liaison will reach out to the chairman of that committee and, and see if we can't get that set up. Um, Specifically with budget, I will tell you, um, generally the answer to your question is yes. We have, um, the state will collect, like let, let's use the month of January. The state collects January sales tax revenue, process that in February. We'll get a report in, in March of what we collected in January. So there's an interesting lag time there. Um, so at this last audit and finance committee meeting that was held on Friday, they just heard the May financial report in July. Um, the next big important step, and I think this would merit, um, you know, not just the audit and finance, but a council study session is that June financial report, because that will conclude fiscal year 1920. That will give us an idea of how we ended the fiscal year and give us a better assessment of that uh, inner fund loan, the 25 million that was approved by the council, uh, if and, and how much of that we as staff would recommend needing uh, what our management plan would be going forward. So. Um, we'll work with the council very closely on that. I would anticipate here in the next few weeks having that report wrapped up. Uh, and I would say probably an August uh, meeting of this body uh, would be important to have that dialogue as well as with our audit and finance committee. That'd be really good. I, I just I just want us to not be caught flat footed Ab absolutely. with our revenues. And so that stimulus money people have received, they're spending it in our city and we're gonna miss it. Indeed. So I just want to make sure we're staying on top of it. Appreciate everything you do for us tonight. Likewise, thank you all. Thank you. Councilperson DeLucci. Nothing. <laughs> He's letting it happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a couple things. I uh, appreciate my sidewalk down there at 23rd and Lee Summit. looked beautiful. All Indeed. finished up there. Indeed. And one other thing that I would like for you to look into, and I know we've discussed this quite a bit, and that's some of the erosion going on in these creeks throughout the city through years and years and years where it's on city property and it works its way into people's yards, uh, undermining their fences, quite a few locations. Uh, I had this one up here on Mechanic the other day and uh, just wasn't real happy with the answer. I'd like to see, I understand this is the way it's always been and staff goes with you know, the historical thing. I'd just like to see our city uh, counselor weigh in on that and make sure that we have no liability out there that uh, for legal purposes later I know we have a garage in danger of falling in so I just want to make sure we're on the up and up with that one that's all I have how about you uh, I think we only had the room rented until eight so no. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mayor Pro Tem uh, Mr. Mr. Huff uh, I'm sorry, you reminded me of something when you said the sidewalks. Uh, I wanted to give a quick shout out. I got contacted by a ton of residents about Phil Roberts Park, which had in the span of about a week turned into a like a, a homeless condominium almost. Uh, not to make light of it, um, but IPD, Independence Police Department, Public Works and Parks and Rec went out and did a joint cleanup. They had four dumpsters of items that they uh, that they threw away there were uh, a couple of arrests made and anyway it was a, a huge difference maker for the neighborhood so folks were very appreciative of that so was I so please pass that on to your department heads yeah uh, Mr. Walker. We, we will and thank you again for the, the recognition on that I know like you mentioned, there's certainly the human element and the sensitivity there, but of course, there was also our public park and our public grounds that our taxpayers pay for, and we want to keep that in good operating condition as well. So, 
it was our pleasure. Yep. And nothing else for me tonight. I'll thank right. you very much. This meeting's adjourned. <laughs>